Well, on this day that uh, the uh, greeting card company and the chocolate factories and the florist shops have set aside to celebrate earthly love, we can come to chapel to uh, celebrate God's love. Listen to what uh, the Apostle John writes about that love. He says, We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. God's people, let's get it right when we talk about love in this world. The world doesn't understand that. Let's sing about His love this morning. Let's stand together as we celebrate His love. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands. For I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. 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 Again, John says we love. Because what? He first loved us. Let's sing together. Over the mountains and the sea. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the spirit set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands. For I will always sing of when your love came down. I will sing of your love forever. I could 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 sing of your love forever. It's a love that's divine, a love that excels all other loves. We'll sing together this wonderful hymn, hymn of praise, love divine, all loves excelling. Love divine, all love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation, enter every trembling heart. Breathe, O oh, breathe, thy loving Spirit into every troubled breast. Let us all in thee inherit, let us find the promised rest. Take away our bent to sinning, Alpha and Omega be, and of faith as its beginning, set our hearts at liberty. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation, perfectly restored in thee. Change from glory. 
in heaven continually. Let's sing together. We declare your majesty. We proclaim that your name is exalted. For you reign magnificently, rule victoriously, and your power is shown throughout the earth. And we exclaim, our God is mighty, lift up your name, for you are holy. Sing it again, all honor and glory. In adoration we bow before your throne. We declare, we declare your majesty. We proclaim that your name is exalted. For you reign magnificently, rule victoriously, and your power is shown throughout the earth. And we exclaim, our God is mighty, lift up your name, for you are holy, sing it again. And we exclaim, our God is mighty, lift up your name, for you are holy. We sing it again, all honor and glory, in adoration we bow before your that now. May we bow together before our Lord. One of the members of our Chapel Preachers Church is going to come now. One of our students, one of our friends is going to come and lead us in this prayer. Justin Joyner. Would you pray with me? Lord, we just come to you today just thanking you for your beauty and for your glory and just seeing the weather and how awesome it is. We thank you for getting us here safely today to this uh, chapel service. Pray for uh, Dr. Orchester as he comes to bring us a message. Pray that you would speak through uh, through him to us in a special way that he might touch our hearts, and that we can take what we we hear and apply it to our lives and uh, use it for your glory. In your name, we pray. Amen. As you go to sit down, remember today is Valentine's Day. It's a great day to think about God's love. Will somebody be your Valentine? Turn around and. Welcome and just see. Ask them if they'll be your Valentine. <laughs> Jerry, I love you, brother. <laughs> A TV uh, private detective used to ask, Who loves you? We know who loves us because the Father's demonstrated His love for us and what great manner of love He has for us. It's good to be here together as a seminary family, learning to love each other and learning to love this world for Jesus Christ. And today we have someone who loves this world for Christ who's going to preach to us and share with us God's Word. Today we're having the Harold and Barber O'Chester Lecture on the Minister's Family. This lecture series was established to bring outstanding individuals to speak to the seminary family on the minister's family. 
And it's just a special privilege to have one of those for whom the lectureship is named to preach today, Dr. Harold O'Chester, pastor at Great Hills Baptist Church in Austin, Texas. How many of you have ever heard Dr. O'Chester before or who have heard of the conferences they do? Just uh, just uh, wonderful what the Lord is doing with them. Uh, he was born in a Catholic family and was led to the Lord, as I understand it, in World War II when he was in the Navy. And when his family heard that he had put his faith in Christ as Savior, they disowned him. And his father even tried to kill him. Some time after that, uh, he was in his third pastorate when he experienced a very horrible tragedy. His family uh, uh, was broadsided and they were taken from him. After months of recovery, he himself returned to college and then came to New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary to complete uh, his studies here. And while here, God gave him a special gift, as he likes to refer to her, his wife, Barbara. You know, good things happen when you come to New Orleans Seminary. Pass the word on, okay? He's been at uh, Great Hills Baptist Church, he tells me, for 33 years. That's, uh, that's just a wonderful, wonderful and long ministry. The church has numerous ministries. If you go to their webpage, you'll just see they have a, a great number of ministries. But one ministry just really stands out. In 1969, he and his wife, Barbara, began a retreat ministry. And they have just touched thousands of men and women through the retreat ministry of uh, their church. They have numerous uh, uh, retreats for women and for men and then for couples. As a matter of fact, on our campus, uh, Tomorrow night and Saturday morning, they'll be leading uh, a retreat here. What I'd just like to share with you is this uh, statement that you'll find that I believe is at the core of what they're doing to help touch uh, lives and what you will experience here today. We believe God has a plan for every life. It is a matter of finding his will and his grace and becoming all God wants you to be. And I believe that is a wonderful philosophy of ministry. And that's the kind of ministry that comes to us at this time on our campus. We uh, warmly welcome Dr. Harold O'Chester, and we look forward to hearing God's Word as he shares it with us today as we continue our chapel worship together. Back in the early part of the 19th century, a young man in the British Isles I uh, felt the call to ministry and uh, to pastoring a church. He went to the young lady he'd been uh, courting, and he said, uh, I need to tell you something. I need to tell you that, uh, for one, God has called me to be a pastor. He'd been studying for something or another uh, vocation, but God had called him to be a pastor. His second thing is the doctors have told me that I'm going blind and that I'll be blind in a, sh- a few short years. And uh, but I would like to ask for you to marry me. She could not do that. First of all, she didn't want to be a pastor's wife, and she said, I do not want a disabled husband, a blind husband. He was devastated, and as most pastors back then did when they were devastated, they went and wrote poetry. We lost some of that somewhere along the way, but uh, he wrote this wonderful hymn that we're going to sing together this morning. First line is, O love that will not let me go. He understood earthly love was one that was fleeting. But God's love is one that is everlasting. O love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. Let's sing together these wonderful stanzas from the pen of a man who was distraught but understood God's faithfulness. O love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in Thee. I give Thee back the life I owe, that in Thine ocean depths its flow may reach a Here's a blind man who couldn't see, writing, O light, 
O light that followest all my way, I yield my flickering torch to Thee. My heart restores its borrowed ray, that in Thy sunshine's glow its day may brighter has lost everything but finds the joy in the Lord. O oh, joy that seeketh me through pain, I cannot close my heart to Thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain. That morn shall tearless be. O cross that liftest up my head, I dare not ask to hide from thee. I lay in dust life's glory dead. And from the ground there blossoms red, light that shall endless be. tear became blue ocean one tiny grain of sand turning in your hand a world in motion you're out beyond the furthest morning star close enough to hold me in your Father of my 
Thank you, uh, Amy and Andrea and uh, Dr. Jerry and Ken. Appreciate it so much. This is, of course, a special place to me. It's not necessarily a special place to you yet. And uh, maybe it won't be the way it is with me because, as Jerry explained way back in 1886, <laughs> in my first year here at the seminary, I left school the Wednesday morning before Thanksgiving and drove to my church in Biloxi, gathered up my wife and six-year-old daughter and four-year-old son. My wife was pregnant six months. And we started on a short journey to a country church to have an agape feast on Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. And a, a loaded 18-wheeler hit us broadside and killed my wife and my son and my daughter instantly. I woke up four and a half hours later in the emergency room and I was told all about this. And I remember the pastor of the Main Street Baptist Church in Hattiesburg when he told me, I said, well, let me go home be with the Lord and two. And he made a strong statement to me then, as only Dr. John Barnes could and was wont to do. He said, Harold, if the Lord had wanted to take you, he'd have taken you four hours ago. And uh, I attribute the fact that a lot of young people just like yourself who never knew me, I was just another guy on campus. And the seminary professors prayed all through the night, and obviously the Lord spared my life. And uh, thank the Lord for the music department, because that's where I met my wife and married her two years later, two and a half years later. And so this place is a very special place to me, and I thank the Lord for the privilege of being here. Hey, have you ever noticed that a four-year-old critter can sound louder and make more noise than a couple hundred adult voices. He's an evangelist. That means when he's busy, he's gone quite often from home. So he was gone and he was away, I think, about two weeks this time. And he picked up his car and drove in. But that night, there was an unbelievable storm. When he got to the house, it was about 1.30 in the morning, and he was very quiet, didn't even open up the garage door, came in through the front door, tiptoed up the stairs, and when he started into the bedroom, he saw his four-year-old boy, Alex, and his six-year-old daughter in bed with his wife. Huge storm. He knew they were scared. They crawled in bed. He didn't want to bother them, so he went in the guest room and went to sleep. The next morning at breakfast time, he sat down with the kids, and after they had breakfast, he said, Kids, let me explain something to you. When I know you were scared last night, and it's okay when you get scared to crawl in bed with Mama, but, but you do this all the time. And I want to tell you, when, when Daddy's away, he likes to come home and get in bed with Mama alone. So, so if you would, you sleep in your own bed from now on. Well, that was a nice family scene, and after that was over, he was home a few days, and then he went off again. And Carrie, his wife, met him at the airport. If the plane was late, that's normal. There were several hundred extra people there in the terminal area. This was before they stopped you from going up to the place where the plane came in. And they were all out there waiting for several planes that were a little late. And he came walking down the passageway. And as he came out, there was Alex. And he yelled, hey, Dad! You know, I mean, Nick just was so high and piping and rich and everybody just stopped. He said, hey, Dad, I got good news for you. His daddy Excitedly said, what's the good news, Alex? He said, nobody slept with Mama while you were gone. <laughs> Everybody began looking around to find Mama. <laughs> Marriage and family. Important topic. <laughs> 
60,000 Southern Baptist preachers of all stripes, and a thousand of them are leaving the ministry every year. Most of them are getting divorced. If you don't pay attention, you're going to get it. Bad guys after us. Turn, if you will, to that off-read, but we don't read it too often, chapter in the book of Genesis, the second chapter, and beginning with the 18th verse, because this is technically a lecture on family, I want to get to the foundation. Look at uh, Genesis 2, 18. The Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Now, the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs a bone from his side, perhaps better translation, and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from that bone he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man, and the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. For this reason, Adam said, A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. It's critically important that you understand that a lot of marriages are seriously in trouble today. But the thing you really need to understand, young people, is that a lot of Christian marriages are in trouble today. Only recently we learned that Christians are divorcing as quickly as people who are not Christian or religious. But even worse than that, marriage is closest to home for you and me. Church staff marriages are ending on the rocks. And so here we have men and women like you and me who are supposed to be reasonably mature as Christians who simply either do not understand that the institution of marriage did not originate in some moral, sexual swamp of immorality, but in the divine heart of God. And just as Christ was present in the creation of this institution, Jesus wants us to understand that His presence and His power are available today and continue to be available and active in the establishment of marriages. Thus, could Jesus say, these are those whom God has joined together? I mean, it's very difficult for me to try and bring this kind of an address to erudite people like yourself, people who are acquainted with the difficulties. But I want to tell you, unhappy marriages are affecting every area of our lives. I mean, not just business health, the health of everyone, the emotional security of uh, of these children, but I'm telling you, young adults, it is affecting churches unbelievably. Many a deacon has vent his spleen upon the pastor because he's unhappy at home. Many a love sick woman has taken advantage of, of the niceness of the pastor and caused him to make a wrong decision. And it's critically important that you understand these things. Now, let's really take a look at this passage of Scripture from its beginning. We know that the Bible said God with a divine fiat brought the world into existence. And following the creation of this universe, God reached down into the earth and with the Hebrew word asa, this word that could take the meaning of a formation or simply taking the dust, He made man. Now, I don't know how long God and Adam, or man, walked in the garden. But I do know that there happened to be some point in time when God looked deeply into Adam's heart and life and made 
honestly, what is the, one of the most unbelievably and startling statements you can imagine. He looked at Adam and said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I, I don't know the intricacies of that, un, of that translation, but I do know this. Somehow, Adam found himself in a dilemma. The Bible simply said he was lonely. Now, what is shocking about that statement is the reality of the fact that in spite of personal intimacy with Holy God, the opportunity to walk with God, the opportunity to talk with God, it still wasn't good. That wasn't good enough. And so this declaration, not good, is amazing. And for you folks who are studying the language, I want you to understand that this declaration of not good is not the usual and ordinary expression of displeasure to be found in the Hebrew language. It is the strongest usage of the Hebrew for expressing negative reaction. I want to tell you guys and gals, when God says something is not good, you know what? It's not good. It's not good. And you need to feel the weight of that. What we have here is God's aware. Don't, don't ask me questions that I can't explain. You know, how come God came to this awareness that He just, you know, all of a sudden gets smart? I don't know. But what we have is God's awareness of Adam's incompleteness. That's astonishing. Can you just try and imagine with your finite mind that God, who does everything perfectly and everything right, is saying about something He just created, it's not good. Well, let's try and analyze that. First of all, you've got to understand that Adam was in a perfect environment. Adam was good, perfect himself. His mind was not corrupt. His heart was pure. His circumstances were good. There wasn't any pollution. There wasn't any traffic jams. There were no diseases. He had no job difficulties. He had no competition. And in spite of all that, God says it's not good. Now, I want to tell you something else. He not only had this perfect environment, but the Bible says that he possessed everything. He owned it all. He didn't have to worry about the IRS. He didn't have to worry about retirement plans. The Bible simply says in verses 28 through 30 that everything God created in the garden was his. Wow. But that's not all. God even created for Adam an exalted position. God said, hey, Adam, you've got dominion over everything. You have no job insecurities, no jealousies, no pressure to perform. The truth was he was sitting on top of the ladder. No, the truth was he was the only one on the ladder. Now, listen. Exactly what God is saying in this passage of Scripture. He's in a perfect environment. He has an exalted position and he possesses everything. Could that mean that if you became the pastor of one of the great mega churches of the Southern Baptist Convention or in your ministry you become a, a real godly spiritual leader in the Southern Baptist Convention? I mean, if you had all that, you still might not be happy. I mean, does that mean that if you accumulate resources in your lifetime greater than the Gateses and the Waltons of the world, you still might not be fulfilled? Yeah, evidently so. This is what God is trying to help us to understand. I mean, getting to the top of the ladder is not fulfilling. 
the shocking thing to me in this passage of Scripture, which, of course, I've preached from and looked at over and over again for the last 40 years, was the reality that Adam had this unbelievable ability to talk with God intimately. I mean, person to person. To walk with Him in the cool of the day or the cool of the evening. And it was still not good. His dilemma was that he was alone. Now, you say, why are you spending so much time? You've got to understand the significance of the institution of marriage. It's so important to you and your ministry. I mean, you, you understand that the sovereign God could have fashioned Adam any way he desired, but he chose to fashion Adam in such a way that Adam needed intimacy with someone other than God. Why, wow, this vertical intimacy is absolute and the most important intimacy you can have. But God designed us. For horizontal intimacy, which is absolutely necessary. And so because of that, you know and I know that when God created Adam, He created Adam with physical and emotional and spiritual needs. Is this, you think, what maybe the Holy Spirit had in mind when in the book of Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 5.23, the Apostle Paul says, May God Himself sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your whole spirit, soul, and body. Well, I want to simply remind you in a very simplistic way is that like God, you are three in one. As God is Father, Son, and Spirit, and yet one, so we are body, soul, and spirit. Many years ago, Adrian Rogers and I matriculated here and graduated in the same class. And it was Adrian in his first book who said that, folks, you've got to understand that with our bodies we have physical life, and with our souls we have psychological life, and with our spirits we have spiritual life. What he was alluding to is the reality that with our bodies we know the world beneath us and with our souls we know the world around us and with our spirits we know the world above us. And we're all conscious of the fact that when our body's right, we are healthy and, and when our soul, our will and, and emotions are right, we are happy. And when our spirit is right, we are holy. Now, that's us. But then God takes a man and joins her to a woman. And He says very clearly, if you're going to have the right kind of marriage, you need to have a healthy marriage. You need to have a happy marriage. You need to have a holy marriage. Why? Because God created us. With needs. Now, I'm addressing more the men than the women simply because I believe God tells us more than one time that the major responsibility in the marriage relationship is the guys. I mean, every woman knows, and I hope every guy ought to know, that there isn't a newborn baby that is born without the same kind of needs. Every baby needs attention. Every baby needs affection. Every baby needs approval. Every baby needs comfort. And these needs don't leave us just because we're 25 or 30 years of age. We carry these needs throughout life. I mean, some even wonder, why would God create humanity with these needs? Well, I don't know the exact answer to that, but I have an idea from the many years of my ministry that perhaps we would have to look beyond ourselves and trust God for His provision to meet those needs. Is 
That's what Paul means when he says, My God shall supply all your needs according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus in Philippians 4.9. Knowing that we have needs, guys, God says, okay, Adam, I'm going to solve your dilemma. And so the way he was going to solve Adam's needful dilemma was to create another human being with whom he could be intimate. And so in Genesis 2.18, the Bible simply says, God says, therefore, I will create for him. I don't know whether you've learned this yet. When God says, I will, he will. Now, you can go to the bank with it. When God makes a commitment to you, you can go to the bank with that commitment. So, using a new word, a word we've also translated create, he uses the word bana in the Hebrew language, which carries the concept of building or construction. It's an architectural word, and the Scripture uses that word. I want you to understand very frankly from the entire text, woman is the zenith of all God's created activity. With her emergence, all creation then ceases. Her presence was an advancement to all that God created for her and Adam. Thus, when God got through with Eve, He could say, now it's very good. Now, it's very good. And what does the Bible say? He brought her to man. Why? Specifically, to relieve his loneliness, his solitude. She was to be with him and to meet his emotional, spiritual, and physical companionship. But this next phrase is important, so let me read it to you. The man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a very cryptic statement, to say the least. However, this particular statement is unbelievably necessary to understand the relation of a husband and wife. Someone said, and I quote, that monumental times and monumental places require monumental phrases. It's those phrases that make historical moments. Let's roll! What does that conjure up in your mind? You know what it conjures up in your mind. The simplistic statement of Abraham Lincoln in his Gettysburg Address, though in all likelihood was more spontaneous than planned, has held the position as a cryptic, simple statement in all-time way. General MacArthur, whom most of you only know as a historic figure, said on two occasions... Once he said, I shall return, and he was talking about coming back to the Philippines, and he did. And it buoyed the spirits of our American troops and the Filipino troops for years. But then as he was retiring, he said, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. We sent men to the moon several years ago, and one of them surely practiced the words he was to speak when the first human set his footprints upon the moon. He used those immortal words, one small step for man, one giant leap for step for mankind. Now, hey, if there ever was a historic time in history, since history began with the creation, if there ever was a historic time, it was here in the Garden of Eden. I mean, it's been a tough day for Adam. You've got to see the picture. He's been naming animals all day long with the promise of God ringing in his ears, I'm going to make you a help me. So, he's been looking for her for, I don't know, for hours. So, drowsiness comes over him and he drinks heavily from this prospect of sleep. 
And while he was sleeping, God performed some kind of surgery upon Adam and he hand fashioned a woman. Now, I need your imagination. He's sleeping. He's been looking all day for this one that God said was going to be his alongside one, his companion. I mean, you know, there are two giraffes coming by and two hippopotami coming by and two elephants coming by and, and one thing after another. And uh, he's looking for it. He falls asleep. He wakes up and there standing before him is a creature whose beauty is beyond description. All of the emotions that God created Adam with obviously are stirred. He stands up to full height, takes a deep breath and says, This is bone of my bone flesh. I, boy, I'd have said something different. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd have said, Woo! But he said, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She's going to be called woman because she was taken out of me, out of man. Now, on the surface, this seems like a letdown. It seems more like a laboratory report rather than the romantic overflow of his heart. But however, in my ignorance over what he said, I began to see some significant hints. You say, wasn't Adam filled with the Spirit? Certainly was filled with the Spirit. Malachi confirms this in Malachi 2.15 when he says, and I quote, And did he not make one, speaking of Adam, yet he had the residue or the excellency of the Spirit. So I had to conclude when I read this unbelievable statement, bone of my bone, upon seeing Eve for the first time, that this was a statement that could only be attributed to the Holy Spirit after all. Otherwise, how would he have known anything about a father or mother that was spoken in that statement? Now, to translate, this is bone of my bone, is a rather difficult phrase to translate. I'd like to use a paraphrase, which is not good theological training, I'm sure, but I'd like to use a paraphrase that I think really gives the emotion of his heart. The loving paraphrase, and that's the name of the man who wrote it. The loving paraphrase paraphrases this bone of my bone statement as, this is it. This is it. What? What God had promised him. What he had been looking for all day long. So let me, in the last few minutes, deal with this statement because I think it's critically important. What was this statement. First of all, for Adam, it was a declaration of consent. It is almost impossible for me to give you or any professor to give you, I'm telling you, an accurate translation of this statement in English. It was not a causal, neither was it a scientific observation. It was the spontaneous, God-directed response of a heart of love toward a woman. You say love's not in there. It may not be in the text, but it is saturated with the concept. Do you know what Adam is saying when he says, now this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh? I think what he is saying is to Eve, I received you. What did God say? I am going to give you. And so I hear Adam saying, I receive you. I accept you for what you are, a gift from God's hand. I mean, she was exactly what Adam needed. I'm not trying to be coarse, but to be honest, they even fit together. God made them that way. I mean, he looked at her and it was unbelievable. You say, well, he didn't have any choice. Oh, no. Oh, no, young theologian. He already had the gift of will. He did not have to accept her. He could have rejected her. And I want to tell you, rejecting the one that God has for you before or after the fact is going to cause you more misery and more disillusionment than you could ever imagine. He could have accepted a female giraffe. Now, I don't know. That would have been hard. Or a female skunkress, or whatever you call a female skunk. 
But he didn't. He received and accepted his wife. And I want to tell you something. In thousands of counseling sessions, I have come to the conclusion that rejection is one of the biggest of all the world's evils in two people getting along. In almost every marriage ceremony I have participated in and you participated in, there is the phrase, do you take this woman? You say, well, yeah, I, I, I participated in that. Fine. This implies that you are receiving her. But it also more than implies it is in reality. You're receiving her with no conditions involved. I want to ask you a question. And now I'm getting to be a little preachy. Have you received your wife as a gift from God? It was no freak that you two are together. It was divine providence. And you've got to agree with James in 117 that every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. She may not be perfect in your eyes, but you need to see her through the eyes of God. Because God beholds your wife as perfect in righteousness. And if you look up Romans 8, 29 and 30, and you look at all the whoms, the W-H-O-M-S, you will find that she was foreknown and predestined and called and justified and glorified and given to you, guys. She is God's gift to you and is your responsibility and mine to receive her. Secondly, unless that's a call from God, you might as well turn it off. I get these every... We're on television. Uh, have been for 30 years in Austin and, and people forget to turn their... Well, anyway. Um, it's an affirmation of completeness. When Adam said, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, what I want you to understand, listen now, she was the finishing touch of God's glory. If Adam is the head, then you've got to understand that she's the crown. A crown to her husband and the crown to the visible creation. Adam could have said, I was not all here until you came, but now that you've come, I am now complete. You are the rest of me. So that together we are to fulfill what the Father ordained us to be and do. I will say this to you ladies. Remember, it's critically important that you understand, ladies, that you're here to complete your husband, not to finish him off. Another, he's a, it was a commitment to togetherness. Even before there was a father or a mother... Adam declared, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto her. What a vital rule in marriage. Cleaving is absolutely essential to marriage. There cannot be a cleaving unless there's a leaving. To cleave means to adhere to, to be stuck with, so to speak, whether you like it or not. This statement was not only a statement of approval of what he saw, but a commitment to leave all else and spend the rest of his days with her. I won't have time to deal with it. Is it not significant to you that Satan approached Eve when her protection was not there? He caught her when Adam was not around? Cleaving means more than bodily togetherness. It involves an interest and what interests her. Next thing I want to mention is that it was a celebration of unity. Of all the mysteries that you and I will ever enter into. You, you know, you, you know, Paul had that mystery, went up into heaven like John did and he saw things no other human being had ever seen. Tremendous mystery. Of all the mysteries that you will ever enter into, marriage is one of them. It defies logic. It defies everything. It defies scientific math. Math says one and one makes two. God says, uh-uh, in marriage, one and one make one. Please understand that before Eve, it was just Mr. Adam. Now, when God presents Eve to Adam, it's Mr. and Mrs. Adam. Follow me now. Adam had to die to the old Adam. 
Adam was not going to be the old Adam anymore. He was now Mr. and Mrs. Adam. He could never act. He could never think. He could never plan as if he is the old Adam. He now possessed a brand new identity. And I don't know whether you understand this or not, but when you got married or when you get married, you're not only attending your wedding, mister, you're attending your funeral. That doesn't sound good, does it? Say, what in the world do you mean? You terminate your relationship with yourself as you formerly were. Your old self is not going to exist anymore. At your wedding, you're going to die to your will and your plans, and what you want is now going to be a we thing. Which finally leads me to say, well, what is marriage? Well, the secular world says marriage is, a, is like a candy bar. It is, a, it is an institution that is to be shared by two people. You know, equally divided among two children. It's a partnership where everything is divided in two ways. Jobs, decisions, authority. It's a 50-50 give and take proposition. I mean, that's, that's, that's reasonable. That's logical. It's just not biblical, ladies and gentlemen. That is not biblical. In this democratic relationship, all things are going to strike an equal balance. Authority and responsibility. That's ridiculous. Any ship with two captains of equal rank is going to find itself on the shoals of life. Two people. Why did Jesus restate that Genesis account when he said, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will become one flesh so that they're no more longer two but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Two people in love, whatever that means. God's presence joins them together in marriage as the vows are sealed. What is marriage? Well, you, you need to look no further than 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 5. In 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 5, the Bible simply says that marriage is the blending together of a man and a woman. It's a hundred percent giving of oneself to the other. I mean, every thinking moment, everything you do after your relationship with God should be done from the point of view, how can I please my wife? How can I please my husband? You say, man, that's idealistic. So what? You've got to understand, anything that God orders for you and me, ladies and gentlemen, He will give us the enablement to do it. Surely you have to understand that in any organization there has to be order. There's a major difference between males and females in the marriage relationship, but it has to do with roles and functions. To argue which is more important is ridiculous. It's as, it would be as futile as you to argue which is more important, the left side or the right side of a pair of scissors, or which is more important, my, light, my left sleeve or my right sleeve. No, we're talking about a difference in, in, in relationship. Please understand, in God's point of view, a man and a woman are equal in relationship, but our roles and responsibilities are different. On a football team, there's a quarterback and a halfback. There's a quarterback and a lineman. They all work together but they take direction from the quarterback. In a great symphony like the New Orleans Symphony, there is a first violinist who gives direction to the rest of the orchestra and the conductor, and they take their leadership from the conductor. Superiority or inferiority are not the issues. Order is. So let me close with that terrible concept that has gripped some quarters in the convention. That is this concept of submission. The word is found in Ephesians 5, but before you wives go off on a tangent, and even though the word means to be subordinate, remember what God says to the husbands. Husbands, love your wives just like Christ loved you and gave Himself for you. Now, you can say whatever you want, ladies and gentlemen, but what God has said to the men is infinitely more important than God ever said to the women. First of all, it's a verb. It is a command. It is 
continuous action. Everybody knows, especially women, that love is more than a feeling. It's doing. It's, and that's why you better do something today or your name is worse than mud. What does he say? He says, husbands, love your wives. Love your wives. What does that really mean? It's a staggering statement. It's a bare knuckle swing at domestic commitment when honestly received delivers a punch that flattens even Christian men. It is a naked call for your willingness to sacrifice unto death. Unto death. This is not a request to give to men to give all they have to their marriage. It's a call to die. I want to tell you something. In the business of a marital relationship next to God, no relationship is more important than mate to mate. It's much more important than mate to children, children to mate, to mom and dad, or husband to church. Critically important. Well, let me just end by telling you one more story. Ralph was walking on the beach in Hermosa, Hermosa Beach in California. He'd been married and divorced twice. He was trying to be a godly Christian man, but he was having a difficult time. He was deep in prayer, walking on the beach, and suddenly cried out, Lord, grant me one wish. And before he got the words out of his mouth, through the clouds came a booming voice that said, because you... You've tried to be faithful to me in many ways. I will grant you one wish. And Ralph said, God, build me a bridge from Hermosa Beach to Hawaii so I can drive over any time I want to. There's a little silence. And the Lord said, Ralph, your request is so materialistic. Think of the logistics of this kind of undertaking, the supports that would be required to reach the bottom of the Pacific, the concrete, the steel it would take. Now, I can do it, but it's hard for me to justify your desire for worldly things. Take a little more time and ask me another wish, and I'll give it to you. Ralph thought a minute or two. He said, well, Lord, you're probably right. He said, you know, I've been married twice. And I've now divorced twice. And both of these women said, I was uncaring and I was insensitive. God, I wish I could understand women. I, I want to know how they feel inside. What they're thinking about when they give me the silent treatment. Why they cry. What they mean when they say, Nothing. And how can I really make a woman happy? Some moments went by and God said, you want two lanes or four on that highway? Thank you. Let we stand together. It's a day for us to think about our relationships, our relationship with our Father, our Lord Jesus, our relationship with each other. May we take this word, and after thinking, may we apply it to our lives. Father, we thank you for loving us so much. Help us to love more than we do. Give more than we give. And commit far more than we do. Through Christ we pray. Amen.